So this is our very first uh, meeting of the minds in, a, in an Australian time. So I haven't had to get up at four o'clock in the morning and nor has anybody else. It was pretty <laughs> early yesterday, wasn't it, Graham? Yeah, it's a little um, bit early. Yeah, for sure. So uh, Dementia Alliance International held a webinar a couple of days ago uh, at in the USA time zone and Richard Taylor hosted that. But it was on the same topic. It's a little bit different to, to what I'm doing today. Um, it is being recorded and will be posted as a public video on YouTube. So if you're using a webcam and are visible on the screen during the webinar, your picture may be recorded as part of this video. If you don't wish to have your picture recorded, just turn off the webcam or move the picture out of the move yourself out of the picture frame. Okay. Okay. Next. Uh, uh, just a reminder that whilst we talk about dementia, there is no medical advice. I'm not a doctor uh, and even if I was with a diagnosis of dementia, I wouldn't be giving any medical advice. Um, so that's just a reminder. That first ever in Australian Eastern Standard Time and tuning into New Zealand as well. Gosh, Val, I'm glad I had New Zealand in the corner of the map. <laughs> <laughs> there was a possibility that we might have had some Japanese guests. Um, oh. and I would have had to change my map and there's a, a journalist and translator over there that uh, I met via Facebook and she was going to translate. So. Um, we may end up having Japanese people at some stage in the future. Um, just a couple of things. If um, you have any questions as we go along, feel free to interrupt. Being able to hold that thought and wait is not necessarily that easy for people with dementia. Uh, so feel free um, and please do accept that this is my very first ever hosting. Um, and so I'm kind of feeling my way in the dark just a little bit. So we don't have Leo, unfortunately, he's not very well. Um, so I will send his our best wishes back to him. So I borrowed this um, statement from Richard Taylor's pre presentation two days ago. A myth is neither a lie nor a confession, it's an inflection. Um, in that sense, therefore, a myth is a modulation of the voice or a change in the form of a word, usually a modification or affixation, signalling signaling change in such grammatical functions as tense, voice, mood and so on. In a sense, it's an angle or a bend. Richard is a person living with the symptoms of dementia, probably of the Alzheimer's type. Yeah, I think you all probably have heard of him. Uh, he is a was a clinical psychologist, but he's not a physician. He's come through his own research and life to become a reluctant expert in dementia. And in our own way, we are all experts in the lived experience of dementia. Um, I know that you uh, don't have dementia, Graham, but uh, your partner does. So in that sense, you're an expert as well. Um, I, I just I did a bit of research into this Roland Barthes guy um, after reading him on Richard's uh, hearing about him on Richard's uh, presentation. Um, he was a philosopher who made a lot of contributions, and he wrote a book called Mythologies in 1957. And he frequently interrogated specific cultural materials in order to expose how society asserted its values through them. For example, the portrayal of wine in French society as a robust and healthy habit is an ideal that is contradicted by certain realities that in actual fact, wine can be unhealthy for us. Um, in the context of dementia, I thought, his thinking on myths is quite interesting um, because the myths of dementia have been and still are very hard to dispel. So the definition of a myth, a traditional or legendary story usually concerning someone, some being a hero or event, uh, stories or matter of this kind, an invented story, an imaginary or fictitious thing or person, um, or an unproved or false collective be belief 
that is used to justify a social institution. Um, the word myth comes from uh, French myth, 1818, and directly from modern Latin uh, and from Greek mythos, speech, thought, story, anything delivered by word of mouth of our unknown origin. It's a fable or a word. Myths are stories about divine beings, generally arranged in a coherent system. They are revered as true and sacred. They are endorsed by rulers and priests, or well, they were, maybe not so much now. I believe that the fifth definition on this page, an unproved or false collective belief that is meant to justify a social institution, is held, being held onto by a health and aged care system to justify their position of power over people with dementia, allowing it to justify it as appropriate and their duty of care, for example, to completely ignore our basin, basic human rights by locking us up. No one with mental illness is automatically locked up for their own good, and yet the frail elderly and people with dementia are locked up every day of the week. Um, and so that collective belief that we need to be uh, kept safe actually helps them, not us. There are some popular myths of dementia. Um, the first one, uh, a lot of people still say to me, there's no point diagnosing dementia as nothing can be done about it. Um, personally, I see significant value in an early diagnosis, regardless of the fact that there's no cure. And treatment of any kind for less than half of people diagnosed with dementia. This is not based so much on having the capacity to ensure your end of life wishes are in order, but being diagnosed early allows us to take control of our health and work on positive psychosocial and other interventions, such as improving our general health and brain health. Um, it gives us more capacity to take control of our health. Uh, the myth that dementia is a normal part of ageing, um, and I must say when I was, before I was diagnosed, I thought that the issues I was having with my thinking and cognition were just that I was getting to middle age. Um, that is wrong. Alzheimer's disease and other dementias are not a normal part of our ageing. Almost 40% of people over the age of 65 experience some form of memory loss. When there is no underlying medical condition causing this, it is known as age-associated memory loss. I think the psychologists call it benign senescent memory loss, and that's mm -hmm. considered a normal part of ageing. But brain diseases like Alzheimer's disease and other dementias are different. Age-associated memory impairment and dementia can be told apart in a number of ways. In general, a memory problem may become a concern if it begins to affect your day-to-day -day living. Most adults, older adults, do not go on to develop Alzheimer's disease or other dementias. Um, it's important to know when to see your doctor about memory concerns and it's equally important to know that forgetting someone's name doesn't necessarily mean you, that you are getting mem dementia. There's another, I don't know that it's a myth, but certainly a, a lot of people say that we're fading away and we're not all there. Uh, even though we may be changing, we are still always all there. A person dying from terminal cancer is still all there and so are people with dementia. We change each and every day and after every significant experience, and that's no different once you've got dementia. There's definitely a myth that people in the later stages of dementia, particularly when they've lost uh, a lot of their ability to speak, can't communicate with you or that you can't communicate with them. Um, I think that that's absolutely wrong. There's a lot of non-verbal communication signs that people can tune into. I used to be a volunteer in a nursing home when my father-in-law was uh, still alive um, and he had Lewy body dementia with Parkinson. And there was a lady there that used to um, basically just hold my hand and follow me everywhere. And the staff used to say to me, don't waste your time on her, she's away with the fairies, she's not all there. And within three months I knew her name, I knew that her father had owned the first car in a farming district north of Adelaide. I knew where she'd gone to school. I knew what her career had been. 
And within six months, she used to start to recognise me. Even though she didn't know my name, she knew she knew me. And I learned so much information just by taking time to sit with her. Sometimes she might not speak for 20 minutes, but she would eventually get the words out. Um, when I first started nursing after my training, I worked in a dementia unit, ironically the first one in South Australia, uh, like a secure unit. And there was a lady there, um, I think her name was Nellie, and it doesn't really matter because she was in her 90s then, um, and I'm not giving away who she was, but she wouldn't speak to anybody. And I used to, she was a real place of mine, and I took her to the toilet one day, and I was sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, and I said, oh, come on, Nellie, please go to the toilet. And she looked up with me and winked and said, go to the toilet for your bloody self. <laughs> and I'd been working with her for probably three months, and I said, Nellie, so you can speak. Why don't you speak to everybody? She said, because they don't treat me well and I can't be bothered. So she would uh -huh. only speak to me in the bathroom or the toilet. So I think that in aged care sector, people would be quite surprised how much people can speak if we just shut up and listen to them. Um, and yes, even in the latest stages of dementia, we can communicate with you. Uh, some more popular myths, and I hear this one all the time. We don't have memory loss, therefore we can't possibly have dementia. We can still speak and function in public, therefore we can't have dementia. Um, I think that when I think about all the people around the world who are doing what I'm doing and what you did last week in Kayama Vida, uh, and what Maxine's doing, Graham, and Val, I'm not sure if you're a person with dementia or uh, somebody else, but, you know, there's a lot of us around the world um, speaking in public now. Um, it's not necessarily obvious how hard it is for us to speak, but it doesn't mean that we don't have dementia. Um, it's a common misperception, especially for those people diagnosed earlier and younger. Um, I think that the analogy that I first heard Christine Bryden use of uh, being like a swan, she's you know calm and serene on the surface but paddling madly below the surface to keep afloat and that's what people with dementia do when they're functioning well and I, I certainly know that for me uh, that's my paddling is a lot harder and I have to use a lot, get a lot more support. Um, and the other thing that people don't see, for example, are uh, my and other people with dementia would have the same experience. We have a lot of support setups at home um, that are no different to any other disability aids that people with other disabilities use. So I have to use Webster packs because I can't manage medication. But sitting here talking me, to me today, you wouldn't know that unless I told you. I have reminder bells on my phone, on my iPad diary, on my laptop diary, on my husband's diary. Um, to So there's a number of reminder mechanisms, for example. I've got some laminated uh, sheets for to assist on the days that I can't remember to do you know, everyday things like get dressed in the right order. So they're the sorts of things people don't see. Um, but to meet any of us here today um, for 15 minutes in public, probably none of us look like we've got dementia. Um, one of the other, it's not so much a myth anymore, it has been dispelled actually. Um, but it definitely people used to say that if you had dementia, you didn't feel pain and therefore uh, mm. you were never given any pain relief. There's a growing mm. body of research that's found that many of the symptoms often written off as just part of the challenging behaviours of dementia, things like agitation and aggression or withdrawal or repeatedly asking for attention is actually untreated pain for people with dementia. 
Indeed, mm. pain is the biggest cause of such symptoms, including even language breakdown, according to a, a recent review in the Journal of Clinical Interventions in Ageing. However, um, the authors of that review concluded that while pain is often the underlying cause of some behaviour, patients are often given inappropriate sedating medication instead of pain relief. Simple pain relief like Panadol would probably fix uh, many of the so-called behaviours. It's not that dementia causes pain, but the seven and a half or eight million people in the world with dementia tend to be older and therefore perhaps more prone to aches and pains. Many patients lose the ability to talk, but even those who are coherent may struggle to find the right words to describe their discomforts. I had a young friend living in aged care who died of vascular dementia and he had dyslexia was part of his dementia. And if you asked him a yes or no question, instead of saying yes, he'd say no when he meant yes. And when we asked, yeah. Him, yeah. <laughs> we asked him if he had pain, that he told the registered nurse no, but if you went to touch him, he'd scream. So to me it was obvious he was in pain, but the registered nurse refused to give him pain medication. And it wasn't until I called in external palliative care team um, to manage his pain properly that, uh, you know, he ended up having a peaceful death. Um, but the problem in the health sector is lots of health professionals are still not aware of the fact that people with dementia feel pain and they may dismiss the changes to behaviour such as becoming dementia as, to, as becoming agitated simply as part of the dementia. Historically, we used to believe that no one with dementia could feel pain because of the effects of their illness on the brain. But in recent years, it's, it's realised that that is not the case. Think how frustrating it would be if you can't find the words to tell someone, I'm in agony or this is hurting. Just like everyone else, of course, people with dementia feel physical and emotional pain. We are, after all, still human beings. I think historically there's been a myth also that people can't live well with dementia. Um, Graham, I think that Maxine's living pretty well with dementia uh, in the sense that uh, she's um, supporting other people uh, and using a lot of non-pharmacological interventions herself, uh, for example, staying fit. Um, living well at any time of life is probably what we all want. But when you add in the diagnosis of dementia and then the prescribed disengagement that we're given when we're diagnosed, meaning give up, get your end of life affairs in order. Uh, I forgot what it meant, that's my term. Um, uh, help! Um, yeah, get yourself uh, acquainted with aged care and live for the time you've got left. If you're told to do that, how could you ever possibly have any hope of living well? Sorry about that little... Uh, it got called a brain fart the other day. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually a growing body of research to support um, people that people with dementia can live well um, and engaging in non-pharmacological interventions or positive psychosocial things, it may not be a cure but it definitely improves our quality of life and our sense of well-being. And I feel quite certain that it has slowed my functional decline. Um, I firmly believe if we treat the symptoms of dementia as disabilities rather than a death sentence, um, as you would if you lost your legs in an accident, you'd either get fitted with artificial limbs or a wheelchair, you'd go to rehab and you'd get on with your life accommodating the disabilities. And I think that for people diagnosed particularly earlier on in the disease process with dementia, if we were taught to do that and supported to do that, we'd live much, much better lives. Oh, other myths of dementia. Um, and I think I probably read a piece of research nearly every day if we... Uh, oh, no, sorry, I've gone ahead. Um, we know how to cure Alzheimer's, or we will soon. All we need to do is spend more money on research. Um, 
from my perspective, the last couple of international conferences I've been to, it, oh, sorry, um, it seems that we're further away from a cure than we were 10 years ago, which is, uh, you know, if I was hanging out for a cure, I'd be deeply disappointed. Um, but I think that we definitely need research money to be spent more on helping us to live well. Um, <coughs> there are lots of people who still think that Alzheimer's disease is not dementia. Um, well, there are well, well over 100 different types of dementia, of which Alzheimer's disease makes up roughly 50%, I think. Um, and then there's the myth, so if you eat turmeric every week, and a curry once a week, as Don Burke just said on his offensive DVD, um, you'll be cured and you won't get dementia um, or it'll slow down the progression of your symptoms. And that might be true for some, uh, but whether it's turmeric or whether it's some other supplement um, uh, has not really been clinically proven. Um, this was a myth that Richard, uh, this page Richard uh, had had on his slides, that you can't live with Alzheimer's disease, you can only die from it. Well, we're all living proof that we're living with it. Um, sorry about my cat. Um, I, I think for living well with dementia, for that to happen for more people, the attitudes of researchers and healthcare professions need to change. And I think that also the language of dementia needs to change to a much more positive, empowering language. And Alzheimer's Australia have just updated their language guidelines, um, but they've added to their uh, Dementia Friendly Communities Toolkit. And I'd strongly advise those who haven't had a look at it to have a look at it and also to share it with um, healthcare professionals and researchers and other people in the community. Uh, people will forget what you said, people might forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you make them, made them feel. And I have that on the bottom of my email these days because it is so true. And then just reminding you that the vision of Dementia Alliance International, a world where a person with dementia continues to be fully valued. Um, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever does. Mm. And we have recently um, engaged somebody pro bono in Adelaide to update our website. So we now have uh, different coloured buttons that you can press on to either become a member or join the mailing list or if you click on the blue button, and put your email in it, you can actually get the weekly blog delivered straight into your email inbox. Mm -hmm. um, so membership remains free and is for people with dementia, family carers, professional service providers, researchers, others can join our newsletter and our mailing list and certainly click on the blog link. Um, they, they are our um, contact details, including an email, we have a YouTube page now, which all of these recordings uh, go up on. And if you go onto the web page, uh, there are some icons, uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and oh, I can't remember the other one. But if you click the YouTube icon, that takes you to all the recordings that we've done for Dementia Awareness Month. So we've done four masterclasses now. This is our second um, Meeting of the Minds webinar. And uh, we also have put as many of the presentations that members did in Puerto Rico up on YouTube as well. So there's quite a few different videos for people to have a look at up there. So thank you for joining me on this global community. Um, has anyone got any comments, any questions, anything they want to add? I feel a bit... Um, talked out because I was on my own. I was hoping that Leo would contribute quite a bit to uh, the various slides about the myths. But anyway, I've been on my own. Yes, Kate, I will. Great. It's Linda, everybody. Well, Linda um, is um, Vida's partner. Yes, I'm her supporter, so I don't have dementia as yet. Um, 
I was just interested, Kate, in what you said about diagnosis. I was at a conference a couple of months ago, a young onset dementia conference, and speaking with a number of people who were partners of people with dementia, who, as you said, said, oh, well, we just went to the neurologist or the gerontologist and we got the diagnosis and there was really no point in, in knowing anything more. I, I think it's incredibly important if you take the line as you do and as I do that people are living with a range of abilities and disabilities. Yeah. But you need to know a bit more about your diagnosis to know how to manage it and, and what is usual, what, what you might expect, what you might not. Yeah, well, that's absolutely right, Linda. I mean, there's, there's well over a hundred types or causes of dementia and if you know which one you've got um, mm -hmm. and, and you can get some support on finding ways to, you know, you're not going to cure it, but to at least accommodate some of the disabilities. If you know what the disabilities are, like I have dyslexia, and acquired yeah. dyslexia, um, and so I use some of the support through the Dyslexia Association, and sure. I have other disabilities with speech, so I use a speech pathologist, for example, um, mm. and that's proactive, and, and sure, it's not going to cure me. You know, I, I had a registered nurse sit down once and kindly tell me it didn't matter what I did, it was going to get me in the end. Well, mm -hmm. does that help me? live well? Did that give me any sense of feeling like I could get through another day with dementia? Certainly not. But, mm. um, you know, you've got a disability background, I know, Linda, and, and I was lucky yeah. I was at a tertiary university when I was diagnosed and they just said, well, you're no different to any other disabled person. You might have different right. disabilities, but here's what we can do to support you. So mm. I'm really mm. lucky that that's the case. Well, I suppose maybe coming in from our, our point of view, um, uh, Max worked for the last, Max is a physio and worked for the last 10 years in uh, chronic pain. And um, basically, uh, you know, if you've got chronic pain or something like that through a prior brain injury or a motor accident or something like that, there's a whole system that, yeah. that gets you back to function as best you can. It won't get you back to what you were to start with, but. Uh, with mm. the dementia world, you know, you get your diagnosis and you head off into a, you know, a fragmented world of, you know, not much support, I suppose. Yeah, and sort of a, an abyss of abyss of misery, really. Mm. Well, that's, that's right. I mean, uh, you, you know, just one little thing, you know, you're talking about the new terminology for, um, you know, uh, that Alzheimer's has put out. Quite one of the things that it's just sort of amused us over here in Victoria is that it's carers week um, in a couple of weeks. Mm. So the kids have been invited to a carers function. Yeah. Well -time but of course you say, well, you know, what are we going to do with the partners? You know, you made a respite arrangement. Are, you going, are they going to go to a function in the same? Oh, no, mm. no, no, we can't do that. You'll have to arrange respite yourself. Yeah. What? Yeah, it's just, you know. <laughs> so, that, I mean, I know that it's all historical from the you know, how the organisations are formed that, uh, you know, basically once the dementia diagnosis happened, you know, mm. it was all lost, so therefore we've got to look after the carers, you know, create yeah. a carers organisation and all of that. And even though the terminology and the nuances of um, intellectually being put through the organisation, yeah. in practice, so many sort of little fallbacks that, you know, show that in practice, really that's still the people we, we need to worry about, the carers, you know, yeah. counselling for the carers and so on. And so on. I, I think, you know, Graeme, uh, it's hard to stop doing what you've always done. Um, yeah. and I, I think that the, the strong, loud message that's just um, been presented around Australia by Steve Milton, um, the fellow from the UK who came out and talked about his personal and his uh, not-for-profit company's experience of uh, working with friendly communities in the UK, the resounding message that I heard from him was that people with dementia must be given a voice, we must be given services that are for us, not just to support our partners. Um, but you know primarily that, that we have just as much right, a human right, to having a voice about what is and isn't right for us. Oh, I fully agree. And, you know, sort of, uh, it's excellent 
you know, you're uh, advocating and so on for the, uh, you know, through the uh, NDAC committee and, and so on. I mean, it's, mm. uh, it's stepping stones, but it, yeah. And I, we at, at the uh, master class yesterday, the topic, and I think you heard you were at that Maxine, you and um, yeah, no, no, you I, and Maxine I, I was, were both there. Were you there when we were talking to Daisy? Yes, yes, yes. And yes. Daisy, no, Daisy uh, Dr. Daisy Acosta, who's from Spain, and she's on the uh, World Council for people, you know, for dementia. And she asked us what would she like us to take back to the next big meeting in London and and of course my only question was well how many people with dementia are on that council if none why none um, and yeah. that's my only message is we want people with dementia on that council it's about us yeah. still without us yeah. so, you know it, she said to me be patient well I'm getting sick of being patient but we've got no choice that that's where it's at um, Oh no! I, I think that really there's a lot of good people out there, and there's, you know the system is the system, and we've sort of slowly got to change. You know, it's like changing a, a big sailing ship or something like that. I mean, it was great that Daisy was took the time to come and, and sit on the the webinar. I mean, how many yeah. other? Oh, uh, she's fan she's fantastic, Daisy. You know, she, she's like um, Glenn. She's a huge advocate for people with dementia. Um, and Glenn Reese, who, you know, I'm really sad we're losing him from Alzheimer's Australia as CEO, but I, I'm equally thrilled that, that he is currently chair-elect uh, of ADI and is going to be the chair for two years as of the conference in Perth next year because his willingness to see things a different way and not do what's always been done by predecessors it is absolutely refreshing and it's you know we need people like Glenn and Daisy for this to move forward that's right I mean it, it really is um, <coughs> as you um, become involved with the Alzheimer world you, you discover there really is an Alzheimer industry and it's mm. like, like, like industry which you know your office is bigger than my office and by the way where are we going for the next conference? Yeah. There's big there money in dementia Graham. Yeah well it's yeah unfortunately mm -hmm. yeah. well I mean that's that's good and bad I mean that's how the system works you know really yeah. we've got to sort of you know bring them along with us or whatever and encourage them I mean uh, you know yeah. we can't sort of set up a, a parallel universe or anything unfortunately. Exactly. Hi Laura. Hi there. Hi. I was just sitting back and enjoying your presentation. Fantastic. Oh, oh thank you. Leo was sick at short notice, so I sort of had to do it on my own. He rang this morning um, very upset that he wasn't able to make it, but also very unwell. So um, that's what happens. And we did have someone from New Zealand called Val uh, join us, but she's gone. Uh, yes, I saw her. Yeah. 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 So um, oh, I'm glad you've made it for a little while. Um, yes, I cut, cut most of your presentation. So. Oh, good. Well, uh, when I tuned in initially, I tuned in half an hour early because I had it wrong in my calendar. And then oh. I tuned in using the practice link from yesterday and wondered why I couldn't see anything. Oh, no. <laughs> and I've got here eventually. <laughs> and I think it's recording, but I'm not 100% sure. It says it is. So oh, I think good. It's okay. Yeah. Um, yes. So, uh, uh, Linda or Vida, did you have anything to say more? Hi, Laura. Hi. Hi. I'm, I'm Vida's uh, supporter here. Um, <laughs> Hi, Vida. Hi, Linda. <laughs> we had a lot Vida. of fun last week in Kayama together, the three of us. Oh, um, we would have had a lot more fun if we'd had more time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just wanting to go back to that point about disabilities again and rights, Kate. And back to the whole myth in the beginning. I, I spent uh, eight years in Europe and I spoke French during all that time. And I was quite surprised to find a, a top Australian neurologist talking in a paper quite recently describing um, a client's or patient's progress through their diagnosis and saying something about, and then the person began to dement. Now, 
I took that, of course, in the medical framework in which it was written. But in <laughs> French, the word for dementia is the same word as the word for insanity. I know. Madness. And, yes. yeah. and it, I mean, there are so many connotations around the word dementia in English anyway. But I think the fundamental issue is there's that anticipation that that person will lose their mind to the point where they can no longer be responsible for their actions and therefore they have no rights. Yeah, but exactly. It does take away our rights. And I mean, oh. Laura was there, um, the conference in Puerto Rico. Practically every presentation I went to, apart from the ones done by people with dementia, we were called, I heard once a vacant dement, uh, demented, subjects, all these horrible terms to define mm -hmm. us. Um, and fortunately, researchers and the media are perhaps the worst. And but the, you know, then we there are more issues than just the language being disempowering and dehumanising. For example, to get published in nursing research journals, you actually have to use all of those challenging behaviour terms. So I wouldn't be referred to as a person with dementia. I'd be referred to as an aggressive and a wanderer and a, you know, whatever mm. horrible label they want to add. And then mm. I learned recently that some of the rebates for people in aged care is based on things like the word aggressives being That's used. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, we're far, it's a really big battle, but we've got to start somewhere. Um, I did an ABC interview a couple of days ago <laughs> and then they wanted to do a, an article about it. Graham Samuel, our new president, was uh, interviewed as well. And I, I did make a complaint that I'd been, you know, called a person who was suffering from dementia uh, when they uh. interviewed me and, and I've sent them the language guidelines and I'm thrilled that the ABC have... Uh, uh, the two journalists said that they would pass those guidelines through the whole um, whole of the ABC. So, you know, one by one, one person at a time, we might uh, start to see some changing language. Um, but, but it's also a legal issue, Kate. That's mm. what concerns me. Mm. Um, there, Linda, um, uh, I think I might have your email address. If not, you can um, email me even just via Kate. Um, okay. On a meeting of the minds last year, we had a lady on from the University of Bradford in, in England, and she did a whole research um, project into uh, supported decision making for people with dementia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it, it dealt with everything from uh, really improving a person's quality of life simply by giving them choices throughout the day and how to support them mm -hmm. in those choices. Yeah. But um, in England, it is the law that people with dementia have to be given the right to decide. So mm -hmm. left everybody scrambling to figure out how that was going to happen. Yeah, yeah. So it was it was very good. I can send you the link to that um, yes, to, to that webinar, and then maybe I should put that up as a blog, Laura. Sure, yes, that would be a great blog. Actually, I'll do that for our blog today. Mm -hmm. ah. Okay, so I yeah. should send that. Okay. That's a great, a great idea for a blog, actually. Um, but, you know, the, the issue, as I can see it, I, I was working full-time when I was diagnosed, and once I lost my driver's licence, I lost my job, and my girlfriend had a stroke, uh, and she was sent to rehab and then sent back to work in a different capacity. Um, mm. You know, and, and that should have happened for... Every young person I know who wanted to stay at work. Absolutely. Like you, I can see you nodding there, Maxine. Yes. Welcome. I hope your dentist wasn't too mean. I hope the dentist wasn't too mean. <laughs> so she, she, uh, Max came back saying that she didn't think she'd be able to speak because of the injection, but she seems to be. Able to oh gosh. Ah, <laughs> uh, come on, Graham. You can never shut a woman up. <laughs> Especially on this, this thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so maybe, maybe that's this week's blog, Laura. That's a, a good topic. Um, okay. But in Australia, now that the NDIS uh, have kind of got an interest in dementia because of the uh, younger onset dementia key work wow. program money, they're quite interested in that money. Um, they yeah. are a lot more interested in supporting people with dementia. So it always comes mm. back to money, sadly. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
Sorry about Boris. <laughs> He's really determined today to get in the picture. He's um, helping us let this recording go viral because we have cute kitty cat pictures oh, in it. Well, that's true too. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. Oh, perhaps I'll pick him up. Um, yeah. So, any other comments? Like Maxine, have you got any comments? Because you haven't heard the, you didn't, you weren't here for it, but. Well I, well, I suppose just just bringing Max in. I mean, you know, I mentioned that uh, you, you know you worked worked in a rehab hospital for the last ten years, and mm. basically, you know, for dementia, you know, on the one hand, with with acquired brain injury or whatever it is, there's, there's a whole practice and a whole sort of system and a whole Absolutely. umbrella arrangement. Yeah. But, um, and why can't we get hold of that? Yeah, <laughs> I've engaged in self-prescribed rehab with support from a neurophysio and now with support from my neurologist who actually referred me for a 10 week um, intensive at the brain injury, a private brain injury clinic or you know rehab unit. And that was absolutely fantastic and they treated me like any other brain, acquired brain injury patient. Um, and that's when I first uh, started having uh, speech pathology and that's been enormously helpful. Um, and mm. sure, it won't be a cure, but it's definitely kept me functioning for longer. Um, so I think that all patients need to have that opportunity and not everybody wants to be bothered with rehab, but gee, it makes sense to me if it improves your quality of life. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, and, and also, it, you know, I mean, on, on the funding side of things, it, it keeps uh, people with dementia at, 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 home. at home and, and, yeah. and out of the system. You know, well, and also, it would keep me as a taxpayer. I would have still been working. Well, I made that comment at the Parliamentary Friends of Dementia Forum that, you know, I could have been a taxpayer for the last six years if I hadn't been asked to leave work. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, and, and also it saves, uh, you know, the health system. It, 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 yeah, you know, everybody completely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it's only, you know, I go going back to Steve Milton, you know, he was quoting some things that, uh, you know, we were kept, um, you know, out of the system for one year, five years, or whatever, you know, the yeah. spending was going to be enormous. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay, it's Henry again. I'm wondering why, when people are diagnosed, or even as early as that first visit to the GP, why there isn't a team of allied health professionals set up right then and there well, to offer people support. That's right. We need it. Yeah. Mm. Well, I, I know, you know, when people with dementia get into the acute setting, uh, my young friend who had a fall and he was admitted into one of our big public hospitals, basically because he had the word dementia in his case notes, he got offered no allied health support whatsoever. And, and uh. you know, complaint after complaint after complaint, he went in ambulant and continent and left three months later um, unable to walk and incontinent into aged care, age 55. Uh. Now that's appalling. Okay. And when we made some really formal complaints about it, uh, one of the young OT people who happened to be in the meeting, like we had about 25 people come to this big meeting at this hospital, and she let slip that because he had dementia, no services were offered to him. Wow. So, you know, it's extraordinary. We've got a long, long way to go. And, and that's a lot of that's due to that myth, that fifth myth that I put up. No, it wasn't. It was in the definition of dementia to think that we don't have pain, that we don't have other illness, etc., cetera, um, actually supports them in justifying their position of not changing. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. yeah. Well, somebody <laughs> um, who has a, a person with dementia um, in our group, and she said yesterday in a meeting that, um, people with dementia can't feel pain. Yeah. And, and we, just, we talked about that, Maxine, today. That was one of the myths that people can't feel sorry. pain. Yeah. And I, I just was gobsmacked. Yeah. Did you punch her? Here I come. 
I'm here. I'm all boxed together. Yeah. <laughs>